Will UCF be that team once again in 2019? Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, breaking down UCF football. We got to Jeff Sharon on the line from Black and Gold Banneret. Jeff, we had such a great time. Uh, you have much to live up to. The, the string of comments <laughs> and accolades in you taking us through UCF history, the most agonizing, agonizing defeats and the greatest victories and the greatest players and favorite players was certainly a treat. We appreciate it. That, that was so much fun. Um, and I want to thank also personally everyone in your audience who um, who reached out to me and said, you know, from from outside the state of Florida and from uh, schools across the country who, were, who reached out to me and said, man, not only did you tell a great story, we had no idea everything about uh, of all the history that UCF went through and all the and the fact that they came up from Division three in 1979 all the way up to to winning the uh, to winning major bowl games we had no idea about ucf's history until then so um i want to thank those people for for reaching out i really appreciate it and i th and i hope that i gave them and everyone else in your audience a little bit more insight into everything that's been happening at ucf the last couple of years and who knows what might happen again this year Yes, the pinnacle of the program has certainly been the last two years, but most of us have, and many of us have had the perception that it's been da -da 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 chugging along. And then all of a sudden there was some outrageous yeah. peak over the last two years, and that has certainly not been the case. Uh, the competition that's been provided by this football program against major powers for decades uh, is pretty astonishing when you really look at the totality. It's not been one or two to three games. It's been dozens of games in which they've competed against top-notch competition for decades. All right, we got Jeff to talk about uh, the here and now, the 2019 that we're um, so much anticipating all of us and to see where UCF uh, places among the group of five. Uh, uh, a banner that's been upheld by the likes of Boise State and others in the past 10 to 15 to 20 years. But UCF clearly the best of the group of five over the past two seasons. And much of at least the attention has been on the productivity on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, sixth in the nation in points per game last year at over 43 per contest. Despite losing Mackenzie Milton late in the season, Daryl Mack coming in with next to no experience and being able to continue to play in a in a much different way, the quarterback role and allow his playmakers to put up uh, substantial points, and most of those guys are coming back. Yeah, that's one of the things. I mean, I hate to break it to everybody out here, but guess what? UCF's offense is going to score a lot of points again this year. Um, they do return the bulk of their best playmakers uh gabe davis who caught that long touchdown pass against lsu that everyone remembers right before halftime he's going to be back he's going to be a great uh, a potential really good nfl prospect uh trey nixon who transferred over from ole miss he's going to be back greg mccray who is a breakout star at running back uh ran for 1100 yards most of it in the second half of the year he's back adrian killens is going to be a senior this year people remember him for being possibly the fastest man in college football. Had a bit of an off year last year, um, but he's going to be back and probably working on special teams as well. So the skill positions are pretty much set. They lost a couple guys off the offensive line, but the one key guy from the offensive line that's returning is the center, Jordan Johnson. He's going to be an NFL prospect. There's no doubt about it. And he and Mackenzie Milton were effectively joined at the hip. The last few years, they came up together with this young offensive line that initially Scott Frost brought in. So he's going to be back. You're going to have another senior at left tackle and Jake Brown, who's going to be uh, who's going to be key to look forward to. And and the way this all sets up is, OK, so Mackenzie Milton's not back. We know about that. He's going to miss all of 2019 as he tries to recover from that horrific car accident of an injury that he had. Um, obviously he didn't get into a car accident, but the injury that he suffered against USF, which is, which was described to me as exactly what you would see in a horrible car accident. <clears throat> so this is going to be the key battle position battle at UCF is at the quarterback position. Who's going to be at the controls of this high octane speed boat. All right. And, uh, it's going to be between Brandon Wimbush, who just transferred over from Notre Dame, set the Notre Dame all-time record for total touchdowns when he was there, Was had a 13-3 and record as a starter with the Irish. He transfers over as a grad student, so he's a senior. He's got one year at UCF. You have Daryl Mack Jr., DJ Mack, um, who started 
the ECU game, which UCF won, uh, came in in relief in the South Florida game and won, won the American Athletic Conference championship, and lost in the Fiesta Bowl to uh, to LSU by one score, um, and was just a sophomore last year. DJ, or, or excuse me, was a was a redshirt freshman last year. Is a sophomore now. Um, DJ comes back. Uh, it's going to be between those two guys, and then watch out at the quarterback position for the wild card, the true freshman who went to the same high school as Mackenzie Milton, Miliani High School out uh, outside of Honolulu, Hawaii, Dylan Gabriel, who uh, is a lefty, has a cannon for an arm, is very mobile. He's, he's basically left-handed Mackenzie Milton with a better arm at this, at this same point in his career. Um, the projections that I've seen are basically assuming that Brandon Wimbush might get the start. That is not a guarantee. We have no idea who the starting quarterback is going to be. So if you're Josh Heupel, the head coach for UCF, um, it's an embarrassment of riches to see who's going to get the nod. And some of the things that we've heard down here in Orlando is who says that there's only going to be one quarterback playing at any one time. We might see multiple quarterbacks play depending upon situations, um, down distance, whatever you, whatever you may want. I don't think it's going to be a, a, a Doug Johnson, Noah Brindice thing like Florida against Florida state that one year, but um, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see because there is so much talent on the offensive side of the ball. Always enjoy the conversation with uh, Jeff Sharon. You can join him and the rest of the staff there at SB nations, uh, black and gold, a banner at uh, the platform for UCF athletics. So, Jeff, based on the skill sets uh, of the aforementioned quarterbacks, uh, and there's a lot of overlapping, especially I'm familiar with, of course, Wim Bush and watching Daryl Mack late in the season. Uh, is, is there a preference, uh, a particular style that you think fits the rest of the personnel and the concept? Yeah, you know, I, I, the coaching staff has not shown their cards on this. Uh, we, we didn't see overly much in the spring game, I think all, all, all three of those guys kind of got their reps and had some moments. Also, Quadri Jones, who's another quarterback that was out there who actually threw a touchdown pass on a trick play against ECU, um, got some run as well in the spring game. But um, they've been very good at holding the cards close to the vest uh, in terms of um, seeing who's going to be out there to play. Um, I think I, I it, it's so hard to say because – Daryl Mack really proved himself well. I th I thought played better than expected in in uh, it, it, replacing uh, Mackenzie Milton, and especially when you look at that uh, American Athletic Conference Championship game against Memphis. Um, you know he had a very bad first half, fumbled the ball three times, lost two of them, that led to Memphis touchdowns. Uh, the third fumble actually was fallen on in the end zone by Michael Colubiali for a key UCF touchdown. Um, and Daryl was, he pressed in that, um, in that first half way too much. But then in the second half, once he settled down, once they figured out what the adjustments were going to be, go back and look at that second half. He, he ran the ball four he ran for four touchdowns, which is a school record for single game for a quarterback. Uh, and go back and look at the passing because he was his ability to attack down the field, especially with the deep ball. He throws one of the best deep balls I think I've ever seen from a UCF player, probably since Ryan Schneider was around here. Um, excellent, excellent deep balls. Insanely strong arm, insanely big, insanely fast. You have Wimbush, and you know what you get with him. He's, he's not as big as Daryl Mack is. Um, there were a lot of comparisons between Daryl Mack and Dante Culpepper. Uh, when we saw Daryl, not just because they both were number eight, but um, with with Wimbush out there, you know you're getting an experienced hand, really excellent inside the pocket. Is not a run first guy. I think that his uh, his command of the game is a little bit sharper. Daryl at times would wait for his receivers to come open before throwing it, and in the LSU game in particular, that cost UCF a couple of key first downs at times. Um, but again, he has a whole nother offseason to work on it. But Wimbush comes in an already finished product. So it's just a matter of can he adjust to the offense on time. And then Mackenzie Milton has actually been working very tightly as sort of an unofficial coach, basically, 
with all of these guys. And in particular with Dylan Gabriel from Miliani, they hang out all the time. There's actually photos of them hanging out at UCF sporting events. Um, and the coaching staff was so thrilled to get Gabriel in here um, that you, especially with the rules now with how you can play up to four, was it up to four games and still red shirt? I would not be surprised if we saw plenty of action from Dylan Gabriel and then they pulled him and then they, and then they shut him down before they needed to red shirt him. So um, it, it's, I, I have no qualms about saying this, Mark. We just don't know. We don't know who the leader is in the clubhouse right now. As mentioned by Jeff, uh, Wimbush has scored 30 touchdowns uh, throwing and, pa- and uh, running uh, two years ago for a Notre Dame team that beat LSU in a New Year's Day bowl game. So UCF fans, you should like that. It came a year early, though. Although Wimbush left the game late, Ian Book came in and threw the game-winning touchdown pass yeah. in that game. Wimbush is pretty scattershot. So my theory in regards to development is that the sheer number of reps and experience would say that Mac has much more development ceiling. He threw 100 passes last year. He got some some decent amount of reps against some really good competition, obviously, down the stretch in a championship game in the conference and LSU versus Wimbush, who's thrown almost 400 passes in his career and has been a 50% passer with some really talented wide receivers at Notre Dame. So I got to think that through the spring, the summer individual drills, and now into August, that Mac may improve considerably. Yeah, I, I, and it's and it's an interesting point that you bring up because – if you go back and look at what Mackenzie Milton did between his freshman year when UCF went six and seven and his sophomore year when they went 13 and 0, a dramatic improvement. So having a guy like that around to tutor Daryl Mack is definitely a key in, in, in helping him understand that, hey, this is the kind of stuff that you have to work on in an offseason if you want to be the starter here and uphold the level of success that we've established over the last two years. Um, and there's no reason to doubt that Daryl Mack has, um, has certainly taken that on. Um, but again, it's one of these things where we're just not going to know until the early part of the schedule. UCF does have that um, season opener on a Thursday night against Florida a and We're probably going to, it's probably going to be all hands basically treat it like a preseason game. Uh, once you see if it, it, assuming that they get out to a comfortable lead, but then you're at F A. This the first four games of the schedule are, are home for Florida A and M at F A U, which is going to be a sneaky, interesting game because you don't know what you're going to get from Lane Kiffin down there. UCF's first trip down to Boca Raton. Um, that school is er, er, that's a big coming out game for that school on that level because they know that they're getting uh, they're going to get a crack at UCF here. Um, to try and try and knock them off their perch early in the season that could make FAU season, and then the two key back-to-back games in mid late September, home for Stanford. Stanford comes all the way across the country, and then at Pitt. And I know Pitt, but guess what? They won the Coastal Division last year in the ACC, so that's going to be a key road test. By that Stanford game, I think we're going to have a pretty good idea of who is the alpha dog out here, um, but. To that point, we just don't know. And I and I, if at gunpoint, I would put Daryl Mack as the guy who would take the first snap. But I would not be surprised to see Wimbush get plenty of work, um, and, and possibly two, three, four possessions a game. Point number one: I love that non-conference schedule. I am scolding teams as we speak. Uh, I'm in the midst of my schedule ranking 70 all the way up to number one. And we've got embarrassments coming from Washington State and Baylor and others that don't schedule power five teams. The Stanford, I can't wait. Well, at least they play Florida State late but uh yeah it happens often but uh they've got miami and florida state this year so they're 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 pretty yeah. loaded up on some some serious uh non-conference games this year to your point but uh oh i can't wait to see ucf and stanford play can't wait to watch that game the pit game as you mentioned i know is a complete blowout last year but pit is so you know they played notre dame to the wire then they'll go out and play penn state and lose 51 to 6 as they did last year so they they could be a rugged one on the road at heinz field Interesting non-conference schedule. 
to your point about Mackenzie Milton, pedestrian numbers, 57% completion percentage as a freshman, 10 touchdowns, seven interceptions, and then he just exploded 4,000 yards, increased the percentage completion by 10 or 11 points, 37 TDs, became an even better rusher. Obviously, it wasn't mm -hmm. more athletic. He was just smarter about when to run and where to run. He went from one and a half yards per carry to six yards per carry that second season. So, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of development time for Daryl Mack in particular. The rest of the quarterbacks obviously going to take their reps as well, so there's room to improve, but he's just the guy that has that ceiling. Other than uh, uh, the freshman coming in, of course, uh, he's the wild card as well. So, Jeff, as we wrap up the offense, uh, it doesn't appear as though there's an opportunity, a clear opportunity for like a breakout, like a freshman or somebody that we haven't seen because the the lineup is so stacked so if there is that guy let us know but otherwise uh for a lot of my audience that watches the power five and just sketches ucf on a on a thursday night or a friday game or something like that and certainly into postseason play who who do you really enjoy watching on this offense you know it's 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 interesting that I, I just did a roster breakdown of, of UCF, you know, and what are their recruiting needs going to be? You know, they only have four running backs on the roster. Um, and, and that's including Otis Anderson, uh, who's a junior, who's listed officially as a running back slash wide receiver, which, you, which actually in college you don't see very well. But this goes back to what I've told people many times about the kind of offense that UCF runs is it's like the Golden State Warriors. It's a positionless offense. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a running back or a wide receiver, you're a playmaker and the job is to get you the ball on the field in space and let you create. Uh, and that's, that's what guys like that do. That's what Otis Anderson does. That's what, uh, Adrian Killens does. You can line Killens up in the backfield and, you know, sometimes UCF would catch flack for, for running Adrian Killens sometimes between the tackles. But then they would line him out, line him up out wide, and throw the ball to him. Uh, the, the, we, the fastest man on the team. So, um, one guy I think you're really going to see that. Uh, in addition to Trey, uh, in addition to those two guys, in addition to Trey Nixon, who's a huge target, six foot five out of Sanford Seminole High School, um, who is who is developed into just an excellent NFL ready receiver. I think who's going to really open up some eyeball uh, some eyeballs this year. There's one guy I really think is going to be an interesting wild card this year, and that's Marlon Williams. He's listed as a wide receiver. He's a junior, um, but he has um, gotten reps as a running back the last two years on occasion. He's another he's another kind of slash guy, but the difference between him and guys like Killens and Anderson is Marlon's a big kid. He's actually going to be the sort of bruiser back that, or, or could be at least the sort of bruiser back that, uh, that uh, uh, that Taj McGowan was last year for UCF. If they decide to use him in that capacity, if they don't, you got another big target on the outside that your quarterback can throw to, and he's and he he really does remind me of a running back who's just split out wide because he's a big, broad-shouldered kid. He's not lanky like like Gabe Davis is to some extent. Uh, he's they're going to try and get him the ball quite a bit too to try and get some of the some of the heat off of some of those other guys. I'd look out for him. And of course, you know, I've already, you know, kind of skipped mentioning, uh, you know, guys like Trey Nixon, who was, who was a breakout fine last year after transferring over from Ole Miss. And then you're going to have a new tight end this year with Jake Hescock, who last year we saw the tight end position really reestablish itself in the UCF offense because Josh Heupel likes to, likes to be vertical in the passing game a little bit more than Scott Frost did. And so he was able to get guys like Michael Colubiali, um a few more reps. So Colubiali's graduated. So Jay Cascock steps in to that tight end position, and he might be a really good security blanket, particularly for some of the if you if you you're looking for a guy in the middle of the field that uh, Daryl Mack or Brandon Mumbush might want to find in the seam. Jay Cascock might be an interesting guy to keep an eye on. Trey Nixon, 40 catches, four touchdowns last year. Marlon Williams contributed with 18 receptions and one touchdown.